Hi everybody, it's great to be back here again. Itamar, it's Friday. Let's get right down to our Torah lesson. This week's um, portion is very, very special here for us on Itamar. Behold, I will place before you today the blessing and the curse, the blessing on the Mount Grizim, the curse on Mount Eval. What is the blessing if we will follow God's laws? What is the curse if we go against God's, you know, God's um, Torah? And here, again, every day when we wake up in the morning, I look out the window and every single day when I sit in my study, and I'm doing, I'm appearing my lessons and studying Torah. I'm looking out, constantly looking at these two mountains which symbolize the blessing and the curse, which means it's always God reminding us every minute of the day, let's choose the blessing, choose the right path in life, and that's a very special privilege. Now, again, <coughs> I want to invite all our wonderful friends to come and be part of this special privilege of seeing these mountains, seeing the beautiful area where God promised the people of Israel the land and renew the covenant in the land. There's so much history and so much Torah here living in the land of Israel. Wow. But anyway, this week's portion, um, I heard a very big, beautiful Torah from um, Bo Rosenblum, and I'd like to focus, take one of those ideas that he, he mentions, he talks about um, chapter 12, verse number 20. And here, and I want to quickly read some of these verses and then make a comparison to Leviticus, to Vayikra, and see the, see the difference when the Jewish people were outside the land in the desert or when they entered the land, the difference in regarding eating meat. Try to understand this concept. Vegetarians may have to step away for this, but and I think we'll have maybe an answer a little bit to vegetarians, but anyway, let's get to work. <coughs> so we see quickly in chapter 12, verse number 20, it says like this. It says, When God will expand your borders, as God has spoken to us, the promise to the forefathers, and here we are entering the land of Israel, and you want to eat meat, because you have a desire to eat meat. Um, because now it's no longer like in the desert. When you have the tabernacle right next to you, you're always able to bring sacrifices into the tabernacle. Here, you're far away from the, from the tabernacle, that all the temples are standing at, and you want to eat meat. So it says, um, and you shall slaughter from your flock, from your cows, or whatever, from your, from your flock of sheep. And the chalta b'sharech, and you will eat in your gates as much as you, as you desire. Basically, we see here when God blesses us with the land, and we return to the land, we have an option of eating meat. So, what happened in the desert? Was it the same option or was it different? So, if we quickly look in the book of Leviticus, chapter seventeen, and more well, verse I'll quickly skip over um, some of the verses. I want to get to the point, but if you look in chapter seventeen from verse one and onward, you'll see how here discusses eating meat in the desert. And it's a little different. What does it say? If you look at verse number, um, let's quickly skip over. Yeah, let's read it quickly. So God commands, God commands Moshe saying, speak to Aaron and the children of Israel say, anyone from the house of Israel who slaughters a cow, a bull, um, or kesev, or ez, or a sheep, or, or a goat. What does it say? What does it go on to say? the camp, or Asher Yishchat Mechutz Lamechana, or slaughter outside the camp. Ve'el petach ol mo'ed lo hevi'o. He doesn't bring it into the, into the ol mo'ed, referring to the tabernacle, like the temple, right? Tabernacle, la'kriv korban l'ashem, lefnei mishkan Hashem. He doesn't bring it to the mishkan, to the tabernacle. Dam yichashev lishahu dam shafach. It's considered, although he has spilled blood, v'nechrat ha'yishahu mekerav amo. And therefore he will be cut off from his people. Which means, in other words, unlike being in the land of Israel here in this week's portion when the, when the permission to eat meat was allowed, here we see in the desert we weren't allowed to eat meat on a regular way, as we desire, but only in connection to the tabernacle. If we were going to take this meat and sacrifice it as a shlamim, as a, as a peace offering to the tabernacle, we were allowed to have the meat. And then it goes on to say in verse number 6, it says, V'zaraka kohen et adam, and the kohen will... We'll, we'll um, throw the blood, sprinkle the blood, etc. And he will offer up the um, the chilev, which means the special um, fats. The lois bechu od ezivchehem. It's very important. Verse number seven. It says they will no longer um, slaughter to the lasiirim, meaning to the to idols. They will no longer be slaughtering to the um, dark side. Kihem zonim achrehem hukat olam. This is an everlasting ordinance. So we see over here right away that in the desert, the people were not allowed, it seems very clear that they were not allowed to eat meat, the Jewish people, right, in the desert, for personal um, benefits or personal pleasures, 
but they were allowed to eat meat only for the purpose of bringing it as a sacrifice. But when they entered the land of Israel, it was permitted to finally eat meat properly. I mean, not only enough for the bringing it to the temple, which wasn't built right away when they first entered the land. They still had the tabernacle, right, moving around to different parts of Israel. But it was divided into the tribes, and everyone, not everyone lived near the center. So obviously, it would be hard to every time eat meat to bring a sacrifice. So again, we see permission to begin to eat meat, and this was for... For, of course, for um, until this very, very day, we're allowed to eat meat, when it, right? Wake up vegetarians, but, you know, I'm not knocking vegetarians, God forbid. What I'm trying to say is that maybe vegetarians should step aside here. Here, the God is allowing us to eat meat. We have to understand what this is all about. And I'm going to talk about vegetarians today. It's probably the focus. Maybe we'll focus on that today a little bit more. But anyway, you see here, interesting, the desert where we were not allowed to eat meat for our personal selves, only bring it as a sacrifice. And when you come to Israel, you're allowed to eat eat meat, and, uh, and um, not only for, for bringing it for sacrificial purposes. Uh, that's the question. So I'd like to quickly um, bring down here, it's very interesting, in the, in the Talmud, in the, in the Gemara, it brings down in the tractate, where is it brought down in the tractate in the Gemara? Well, in the, it's a mesechet called Chulin. Chulin is a mesechet uh, tractate which deals with laws of slaughtering, etc. And there it talks about a very interesting um, discourse between two great Tanaim, two great sages. One is Rabbi Akiva, the famous Rabbi Akiva, and one is Rabbi Ishmael, famous Rabbi Ishmael, two very, very special rabbis, great rabbis. And they differ in, in, in halacha. Rabbi Akiva says something, what's that Rabbi Ishmael? Rabbi Ishmael says, very clear, as we saw here, the understanding of these two verses, that in the desert, we were not allowed to have slaughter meat for our own purposes, right? Only for the purpose of eating in, this, in the temple, then which was the tabernacle, that's what Rabbi Ishmael says. Only oh, we got to the land, we were allowed to slaughter meat for our personal self. That's Rabbi Ishmael. Rabbi Kiva has a very interesting insight. He says a little differently. He says something very profound, and this is something difficult to understand. He says like this, in the desert, we were not allowed to slaughter meat, yes. Only for sacrificial purposes, for bringing this, the peace offering, right? But we were allowed to kill an animal called, in Hebrew, it's something called nechira. Nechira means it's a different way of slaughtering in any other way or slaughtering in reverse direction. There's different explanations what exactly Nechira means. What basically what the, the, non, the non-Jewish world does when they, to this very day, they kill an animal in other ways. And it says, Rabbi Kiva says, we were allowed to in the desert to slaughter an animal a different way, not kosher slaughtering. That was allowed in the desert. And only when we entered the land of Israel, we would now began to use the laws, the special oral law traditions that we received in slaughtering the animals in the proper way in order to eat meat. So which means, according to Rabbi Kiva, in the desert, it wasn't that they weren't allowed to eat it, they were allowed to eat meat, but they weren't allowed to slaughter. The slaughtering was only used for the temple, which means a special um, way of slaughtering an animal was used for the temple on purposes, but not for the purpose of eating meat on a private lip. I mean, you want to eat meat privately, just kill the animal and eat the meat. It's a very strange explanation of Rabbi Akiva. Only we enter the land, then every animal that you want to eat, whether you, of course, bring it to the temple, or whether you're eating it on a purpose for your personal self, it must be slaughtered. That's what Rabbi Akiva explains. And the question, of course, is a very great question. Is we know the Torah was given in the beginning. We left Egypt, right? It didn't take us too long to receive the Torah. Of course, throughout, you know, that we received all the Torah, all the commandments. But here, for some reason, this particular commandment it's only oh, mentioned this week's portion in Re'eh, which is towards the end of the Torah, which is the 37 last days of the life of Moshe Rabbeinu. So the end of the 40 years in the desert, we see that Moshe Rabbeinu is commanding this law of slaughtering, and which you're going to use, according to Rabbi Kiva, only in the land of Israel. But what happened throughout the 40 years in the desert? It wasn't mentioned at all. It's very interesting in itself. And the question is, if this is the case, that now Moshe is teaching the law, how is it possible? We know the Torah we read, received on Sinai. And on Sinai, every law was given. So although it, wasn't, it didn't, maybe didn't come up yet, but whatever it was, it was still given. Moshe is saying it now. But the law already applies. So how was it that we were, according to Rabbi Kiva, here's one particular law that it was like an exception to the rule. We were allowed to eat meat without slaughtering. And the opposite. Slaughtering meat we weren't allowed to do, only for the purpose of the temple. It's a very, a very, very difficult thing to understand. And... And the answer, of course, well, one answer I mentioned before, I don't know if before, to, to, on, the, on this lesson, but to some of my students we discussed in the past, there are certain laws in the Torah that are pushed off. We know that. Right? In most cases, we know that certain laws apply to the land. They didn't apply yet to the desert. The desert was some kind of like 
a special situation like a um, incubator, getting ready for the land. So we see many laws that don't apply until you enter the land of Israel. But here is something unusual in that it's a prohibition, right? When, it's something, it's not like, in the, okay, the, it doesn't apply it. The, the law didn't begin to work here. When you want to eat something, you do, it the, you do it the way we're not allowed to do it today, which is very strange. It's still very unusual. And um, we, there's something called in halacha, horat sha'a. A prophet is allowed to, you know, of course, you receive the prophecy of God, and he's allowed to say that for now this particular law is not applicable for a certain period of time, a temporary period. And we can maybe possibly explain it in that, in that, in that direction. This temporary period, this law was sort of pushed off, and the opposite was allowed to slaughter, to do something called the chira, to kill an animal in another way. And that's probably an explanation that I think we can come up with. But of course, the answer is, what is the reason why? Why were we allowed to slaughter, according to Rabbi Akiva, a meat the regular way? Why weren't we allowed to? According to Rabbi Ishmael, no one ate meat, only for the purpose of sacrifice. It's very simple. But according to Rabbi Akiva, they did eat meat, but again, in this, this strange way, without slaughtering it. And here's a beautiful explanation to Ol Sameach, one of the great rabbis that commentates on the Rambam. He brings down a very interesting explanation. And that's connected to the verse 7 here, um, what I just read to you. It says that God is right out saying that you will no longer, if we look at 7, you will no longer offer your offerings to idols. Sirim can mean shedim, all kinds of evil forces, right? The dark side we mentioned before. And therefore, Apparently, and this is what the Rambam explains in the Guide to the Perplexed, that the Jewish people, the, the reason they, they were allowed to sacrifice, or these laws were given to us, was to purify idol worship. Because beforehand, these same methods of sacrifice were used to, to God forbid, you know, worship idols, terrible things. And therefore, by slowly educating the people of Israel to taking the methods of sacrifice and applying them in kosher terms and, and, and sort of purifying it, you're sort of koshering off the idol worship. The same way here, God did not want us to use um, the sacrificial method of slaughtering, the actual kosher way of slaughtering an animal, um, because that's what they did to the idol worship. That's how they actually worshipped idols. And therefore, it was only left for the, for, for the purpose of bringing sacrifice to the, to, the, to the Mishkan, because there in the Mishkan, the tabernacle, you're rectifying, we're actually rectifying this thing. We're rectifying what? The idol worship. But when you do it for your own purposes, God forbid a person shouldn't have, you know, have, you know again, when you're working, when you're worrying about your own purpose and your own personal enjoyment, here they can could maybe fall down and use that method for their own personal you know, benefit and then sort of, God forbid, fall to the sin of idol worship. And therefore, they were allowed to do regular killing of the animal, but not actual using the method of, of slaughtering, which they did when they used to worship idols in the past. It's a very interesting concept. But that's what the Old Samech explains. And that's very interesting. But I want to really focus on this whole concept of eating meat. Now, first of all, number one, why, is it, why, why are we allowed to eat meat? Taking a, a, an animal, we spoke of vegetarians before, and going ahead and slaughtering an animal. What did the poor animal do to us? Why do we have to, you know, most people are meat eaters, all vegetarians in the world. But why does the Torah allow such a thing to happen? And to order to understand this, I want to quickly mention, bring down a beautiful, um, great scholar, in the times of the Rishonim, it's going back in the Middle Ages, and his name, and his name is Rav Yosef Gigetalia. He was the, um, he wrote a book called Share Ora, The Gates of Light. It's a Kabbalistic work, but he explains, and I want to read a few lines and try to connect and put this all together. He says like this, he says, I will open for you a great, a great gate or key. Right? He's trying to teach us about something. Why did God command us in the Torah to slaughter animals? He asked this exact question. For purposes of our personal benefit. It says in Psalms 145, please look in Psalms 145, verse number 9. It says, God is good to everyone, to everything. And he has mercy on all his creations. So what kind of mercy is, is God having on these poor animals? And if God commanded us to have mercy, how did he command us to slaughter this animal for purposes, our own purposes? So he says right away, He goes, the, the secret of this, it says in the beginning of the verse, it says, God is good to everybody. What 
טוב בוודאי לפיכך ורחמה במקום הזה. And therefore, because God is good to everyone, all creations, and therefore, He has mercy on all His creations. Now, what is that? What is He trying to say? He's saying, במעשה בראשית הסתמקו על עם בהמה זו לשחיטה. He says, in creation they asked the animals if they're interested in being given over to man for the purpose of being slaughtered. Why? Because an animal does not have a soul, he says. The fish of Behema, ain't la neshama liyona, doesn't have a, a soul, a high soul. La sig maase Hashem u'gotav, can have attained the greatness of God. Va'amar, Hashem itbarach bevriyat ha'olam, lamid lefanav behemot v'amar lem, ritzonchem nishachet v'yochal atchem adam. Do you want to be slaughtered and men will eat you? V'talu madregat behema shena yodar klun, madregat ha'adam sh'yodea u'makirat Hashem itbarach. And you will go up from your level of not knowing anything to a much higher level because you'll become, when, you, when a person eats, an animal becomes sort of part of him. And they said, yes, and God has mercy on us. That explains when a person eats, for example, an animal. Trying to say like this, when a person eats an animal, it becomes part of the person. So now that animal is no longer a regular animal now. It is now becoming a human being in a part of a way. So it's sort of taking this animal, that what, was, what would its life live? It would live here somewhere, walk around, just die off eventually. But here, if it, if it is merits, you know, it's a very deep spiritual concept, but if animal merits in being taken and slaughtered and becoming part of a plate, someone's... Someone's table, wow, it's a great thing. Of course, it sounds a little barbaric, right? <laughs> but how do, we, you know, how do we explain this in, in a more way to understand it in a deep concept? And that's something what here he hints to, and he, and he even goes on, but again, how of course Tom is a little bit limited here. The concept is very deep in that. We should know an animal itself eats vegetables and eats um, whatever, the things that grow, right? Grains what, what, and whatnot. The grains, are we saying the poor grains, what do they let the animals eat then? But of course, the animals are uplifting the grain. The grain becomes part of the animal. In the same way, the earth is so happy to give forth its minerals and to allow, the, um, allow the, the, all the grains and all the vegetables that grow off the ground to, to grow and nourish on the earth. So it's like it's a cycle from starting from Mother Earth, giving over to the vegetables and giving them the vegetables to be eaten by the animal, and then man will eat the animal. And that sort of uplifts. But what's really the difference between us and an animal as human beings is we have a soul. We have a soul, and our and focus in life is really to do spiritual and spiritual things, and to uplift ourselves and to grow spiritually. And therefore, if, if an animal becomes part of a person who has that spiritual growth, then the animal will be um, rectified. But what happens if a person is a, a behemoth himself? A person is an animal himself. He's acting like an animal. Obviously, in that situation, the animal is not being rectified when he's eating him, and that's why our rabbis teach us. That a person who's not on a high spiritual level, he should be a vegetarian. Yes, you heard me. He, very, <laughs> most people in that situation should be a vegetarian because they're not on the level to eat meat and to rectify the meat. Interesting, right? And therefore, really, we know we do have meat. We have it on Shabbat, like right now we're getting ready to go into Shabbat, or holidays, or special, special occasions where we, have, we learn Torah. We're really not supposed to go wild and have a lot of meat, only when we really could rectify and, and, and that has to do with us being very, very pure human beings. Otherwise, the poor animal is not going to be rectified. There's an amazing story in the Talmud, again, in, in Bav Metziah, in the Gemara. It talks about Rabbi Danasi. Rabbi Danasi was walking one time, and he saw a little calf, and the calf came over and put its head on him. And he says, Yala, go. He sends him off, like, why don't you go to whatever, to the slaughterhouse? He sort of hinted that, go to the slaughterhouse, because that's what your, your purpose you were created for. And what happened to Rabbi Danasi, he was a prince of Israel, one of the, he was one of the head of the, and he was the prince, right? The head of the court, he's the one who wrote the oral law. He ended up suffering, he had many, many years of suffering because he was cruel to this animal. That's what the Talmud teaches in Bab Metzi, and the question is, what did he do? He said the right thing, and animals, that's what they do to animals, the poor rabbi, what was he punished for? And the answer was, and a beautiful explanation I heard is what, the animal put his head on the rabbi because he wanted him to eat him. Sounds crazy, right? 
But the animal saw a great righteous saint in his whole life. You know, Rabbi, Rabbi Lanasi never enjoyed from this world nothing. He was a multi-billionaire, a zillionaire, but he never had any enjoyment in this world. He never looked for joy for his personal self. Everything was for Hashem. And this animal saw that. It came over to him to allow him to rectify that poor little animal. And he pushed the animal away. And who knows where it ended up going. Maybe someone who wasn't, obviously someone who wasn't on the level of Rabbi Lanasi. And that's why he was punished. See, it's a very, very deep concept and to understand that the fact that we were allowed to eat animals is something that is something to do with, with, with rectification and, and tikkun. It's not just a simple thing. Yeah, okay, cruelty, this and that. The whole world's with people eating left and right, hamburgers, this and that, without realizing, wait a second, you're eating an animal, you're doing something very spiritual, otherwise don't eat an animal, right? And that's why it's, a, it's not a good thing to be running around eating meat. Maybe we should move more until we really get a high spiritual level. But anyway, this is a very deep concept a little different tone, maybe, but this concept, I think, connects very strongly to the opening of the portion we opened up. You know, we, I place before you the blessing, the curse in this world. You know, we want to come to the land. God gave us the land of Israel, a beautiful place of inheritance, and here He allows us to have meat, because here in the land we can reach the highest spiritual level, and then we are allowed to eat meat in the land. In the desert, we're still outside the land. We're not on that same spiritual level to be allowed to eat meat. In a regular way. That explains Rabbi Ishmael's explanation that when we're in the desert, we want to eat meat at all for our own purposes, only to uplift it through the sacrifice. But in the land of Israel, since the land is so holy in itself, we can actually uplift it in a very special way. And Rabbi Akiva's approach, was, which was different, a person is allowed to eat outside the land meat as long as it wasn't slaughtered. And, when we enter, and only, of course, in the temple, you have to use a special way of sacrificing. But it also agrees to the fact that we enter the land of Israel, now you're allowed to slaughter because we can now rectify the power of the land, can rectify idol worship, can rectify all the, the flaws that we have as human beings. And that's the beauty of being in the land. But we're out there in exile, we lack the ability to rectify. But anyway, this concept is a very, very huge and it's a long, long uh, discussion, but I just wanted to touch upon it today for a little bit to open your eyes up. Think about it. Maybe we should be vegetarians. Think about what it is to rectify something and reverse, and reverse the, um, and thoughts sometimes seems barbaric. The answer is no. When you're taking an animal in this world that came here for a short time and you're allowing it to become part of you, it's, it reminds me of someone getting a transplant. God forbid if someone needs a transplant, a person was killed in an accident, he's, he's donating some kind of part of his body to save someone else's life. He's continuing. It's like a, it's continuing that person on. And that's a huge, huge um, blessing for that person who donated. But um, anyway, this is a topic which requires a lot of discussion. Have a wonderful, wonderful Shabbat. We'll be in touch very, very soon again. Shabbat Shalom. Yeshua'ot v'nechamot.